you asked and today I am going to answer. We'll talk about shoes or the lack thereof, protective equipment, what I study, where I have lived and my chronic illness. you I asked for your questions and received quite a few. I tried to make this one cohesive episode but there was just no way. So today will be all about your questions about me and my choices and next time will be all about the garden and my plans for its future. Let's start with the elephant in the room. Why am I not wearing shoes? I started living barefoot about three years ago and since then I've put on shoes for three reasons. Being lazy, being forced and when the situation benefited from wearing them. That means I am barefoot almost all of the time. Over the years my calluses have grown and my feet can withstand a lot. That means my threshold for putting on shoes is a lot higher now. I started going barefoot when I was looking for an alternative to taking opiates for my chronic back pain. I gradually transitioned to sleeping on the floor, I stopped wearing shoes, I became friends with the floor for resting. And it helped. When I released my summary video about the first three months of working on the land and thus showed me working barefoot without the context of my story, some of you got mad, some of you got mean, but most of you were just curious. I've made a video about why I don't wear shoes before, but it was number eight so it's been a while and it was offline for a time in between because I was getting too many comments and emails requesting that I walk barefoot in cow dung or wash my feet naked. I know the internet gives anonymity but some people really need to remember that there are still people at the other end. The video is back online now that there is enough traction for the rest of my videos but it has been a while and it was prior to all the construction work. I kept myself using my kitchen knives all the time and I've talked about it in videos yet none of you suggest I wear gloves for cutting things in the kitchen. My feet haven't gotten any injuries outside since I ditched shoes. We all take certain risks. Have you considered that walking barefoot might just not be a risk you're used to seeing around? Of course there are shoes in the garden house. And the sandals offer protection in areas with a lot of thorns or small shards. The rubber boots offer protection for areas that are not navigable without all-round protection. I put those on when I feel the benefits outweigh the risks of wearing them. Risks? Yes risks. I struggle a lot with proprioception, so figuring out where things are in relation to each other and in relation to me. I rely a lot on the input from my feet. In shoes a lot of that input is lost. I also don't know how to walk properly when not barefoot, so I often injure my joints when stepping uncarefully around in shoes. I also pay a lot less attention where I step in shoes. That rusty nail you all are so worried about is most dangerous to me in boots. If I'm barefoot, I look at where I'm stepping and also I would feel that rusty nail the moment it touches my skin and I could adjust. In rubber boots, I'd step confidently onto the rusty nail and it would go through the boot and into my foot all the same. It's not as black and white as some of you might think. And of course I'm vaccinated against tetanus. In shoes, a lot of the roof project would not have been possible. I needed the full range of motion that only going barefoot gives me. I needed to wrap my toes around the beams for stability. I could not have done that in shoes and would have had to compensate. I would not have been able to feel each rung of the ladder instead adding the risk of slipping. You see, it's not that easy. I live barefoot, so putting on shoes adds a layer of uncertainty to everything. It means carelessness and lack of haptic feedback. It changes everything for me. In addition, going barefoot calms me. I can feel the ground under my feet, the chill of a cold puddle of rain, or the soothing warm of a heated rock in winter sun. Every surface feels different, interacts differently with the soles of my feet. I feel the earth. I feel alive when I am barefoot. In shoes, I stumble through the world, lost and disconnected. I wouldn't go back to that lifestyle for anything. I absolutely appreciate all of your concern. Seriously, I do. Most of you were thoughtful and kind in your comments. 
but that doesn't mean I have to agree with you. If me going barefoot bothers you, I will continue to bother you. Okay, while we're talking about risk, personal protection and all that stuff, let's talk about personal protective equipment in general. If I put on everything you guys think I need to wear, I'd look like a snowman from the future and I would be unable to move. Some of you think I should wear shoes inside the garden house. Some of you want me to wear a mask whenever I'm inside the garden house. Some of you think I should have worn gloves for all of the roof work. Personal protection is important, but personal protection is also highly situational and, well, personal, or should I say individual? There is exactly one scene in the three month video that I regret putting in. Well, into any video for that matter. I am barefoot while string trimming. That is a dumb choice. It's also not a choice I would make. It is something that happened. I was going from task to task and I forgot to put on shoes. And then when I edited it, I didn't notice because seeing my feet barefoot doesn't trigger a reaction. It's normal for me. I should have worn shoes for string trimming and I usually do, but I am human and I forgot. I got away with it, but it was risky. But that's the thing, there was one scene. I don't regret any of the other choices in the video and I would make most of them again. If I hadn't worn gloves for all of the roof project, I would not have been able to do it. The nails were so short, I could barely hold them with my bare hands. In gloves, it was impossible. I would not have been able to do it. I tried and I still wear gloves for a lot of the roof project. But I don't wear gloves in a lot of situations where other people might. I don't put on gloves to do the dishes. I don't put on gloves to repot plants or to plant something. I don't put on gloves for cleaning the apartment. I don't mind getting dirty. I don't mind building up some calluses by getting a little bit scratched. So I put on gloves when I do things that I'm not comfortable happening to my hands. Risks are perceived so differently by all of us. I'm sure you've driven faster than the speed limit or quickly moved the car from one spot to the next without putting on your seatbelt. Well, those are risks I don't take. Next time you see an unusual choice, think about why it stumped you before you judge. We all need to stop judging each other based on the skewed picture of reality our modern society has allowed us to develop. I feel you all. I've been there. I used to be a career-driven wedding photographer who cared about weddings pretty enough to make Pinterest. I don't recognize that person. I'm still far from as tolerant or open-minded than I would like to be, but I try. And more often than not now, I catch myself while judging and I can think, step back and maybe understand. Before we move on to questions about me, there's one question I've received a lot from many different angles. Why am I wearing headphones so much? Some of you asked out of concern, thinking I'd get attacked by mountain lions or men. Others were curious what I'm listening to, and yet others just think the headphones are super ugly, and I definitely agree with the latter group. As you'll notice when we talk about the garden next time, I don't have to worry about getting attacked by wild animals. I mean, yes, technically there are two feral cats that could suddenly jump up and scratch me, but they are shy and I have dog. I'm also rural enough to not worry about strangers too much. I'm surrounded by a village filled with people who all know each other. I was listening to audiobooks for most of the footage you saw. There might have been the occasional full-length listen to the Hamilton musical or my liked songs playlist, but most of the time it's audiobooks. On bad days I tend to listen to audiobooks I've listened to a lot of times before. I don't know how many times I made it through the Harry Potter series before the author ruined the series for me. On good days, I'm usually enjoying a good fiction book. This summer, I think my favorite was Bear Town or trying to learn something in a non-fiction book. There, my favorite was probably Dirt to Soil this year. The headphones are actually a great segue into questions about me. I wore headphones a lot because they calm me. They replace the noise of civilization, well, or my own construction, at least partially with a familiar voice or a song I like. 
I use them as pacifiers, and I've been relying on them too much. In addition to when it was loud, I started wearing them when my thoughts were too loud as well. Lately, I've been working on reducing the latter. I'm still happily putting them on when there is noise, or when I really can't think at that time. I have mentioned some of my issues in videos before, but I've never gone into detail because I don't want to sound like I feel sorry for myself or entice a pity party. But some of you kept asking, so I think it's time for a more full picture. I guess there are three or four parts to this. My rare genetic disease, endometriosis, autism, and my mental health, I guess. For 16 years, I fought to be hurt. For 16 years, I kept telling people that I'm not okay, and doctors and other adults kept telling me that I'm fine and that I should stop complaining. I've been told I'm making it up. I've been told it's all in my head and I just need to relax. I've been told that all women have pain during their period, but they all manage. I've been told we all have aches and pains and it's just part of life. No, hell no, it's not. After 16 years of searching, my friend told me about endometriosis. I was in the hospital with severe abdominal pain at the time and could barely talk. I did some research and told the doctor, but the doctor said it was unlikely I would be in more pain. The thing is, after 16 years, you don't show pain anymore. I was scheduled for an abdominal operation that afternoon. And even though they were in the right area and I had requested that they check, they didn't check. It's part of their checklist, but apparently they only need to note if they stumble upon it unless their suspicion, and I guess my suspicion, didn't count. But now I had a diagnosis that fit my symptoms, so I kept fighting and finally got my diagnosis a few months later. But there was still the entire rest of the month and all the symptoms that didn't feel connected to my cycle, so the bliss only lasted for a few short months and then I was back searching for more answers. At some point, one of the doctors even told me that she has to see the amount of doctors I've seen as a symptom. She diagnosed me when she first saw me and then refused to take in any evidence telling me that she would stick with her opinion. So I added another doctor to that list. By complete coincidence, I needed a printout from a doctor and they gave me more than I asked for. So I first got my hands on a letter from an orthopedic doctor I'd seen a year before who said that I was severely hypermobile and we should look into that. First time I heard about that. I guess it didn't fit the diagnosis the doctor had decided on, so they never talked to me about it. But now I had another piece of the puzzle and I could go down another very long research rabbit hole into hypermobility and then Elas Danlos. A few weeks later, I went to see yet another doctor a friend had recommended and I went there with a diagnostic form already filled out and insisting that he do the genetic testing. To my utter surprise, he agreed and ran the tests. The next eight weeks waiting for the test results were forever long, but in the end, I had it black and white. I hadn't imagined it. I hadn't made it up. It was real. I have classical Ehlers Danlos syndrome and, to my surprise, also osteogenesis imperfecta, so something that affects the strength of the bones. The doctor I'd taken the test with had nothing for me. He didn't know the disease and, to my surprise, admitted that, so I was kind of on my own. He kept telling me to call if I needed anything, but at the same time, he just didn't know what to do. When you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. Well, turns out I'm a zebra. Elas Danlos is rare and classical Elas Danlos is even rarer. My subtype doesn't affect the joints as much as the hypermobile type EDS I first thought I had would, but my entire body is a mess. Connective tissue is part of essentially everything, from your joints and your skin to your blood vessels and even your immune system. Oh right, and the stomach and digestive system. I have changing allergies. I have days when I'm completely strong, can do a lot of things, but I also have days when I can barely walk and talk. I have days when I'm completely fine. Other days I might faint in a hallway. For one to three days during the month, I can't do anything other than roll up on the couch under a blanket, medicate the hell out of my pain and wait for it to pass. And that definitely is not normal. For people with endometriosis, some of the tissue that should be in the uterus grows elsewhere, but during the cycle it still contracts and, contracts and expands. 
and you have pain in places where you shouldn't have any and more pain in the places where it's normal. Let's just put that out there. Period pain to a degree is normal, but anything you can't handle with just some over-the-counter pain meds is more than you should have and you should make a doctor listen to you. The part that is usually hardest for people to grasp is I won't get better. There are better days and worse days, but this is chronic, so it's gonna stay like this. The only thing I can do is take pain meds to control the pain and to work on my body's resilience. I have had the operation for endometriosis. I have taken their pills. I've done it all and none of it worked for more than a few weeks or a month. In the end, I was always back where I started. So I stopped taking their pills. I will not have another operation unless I get a lot worse. And in the meantime, I went all in on my body's resilience. The garden has helped a lot with that. I don't need exercises. I need functional movement and mobility. Nothing like repairing a roof to get that. Climbing around the roof like a monkey, pushing heavy boards around, holding items at the far end of my reach. It all helped. I've gotten a lot stronger over the month I worked on the garden. The garden has always been a lot of help for my mental health. Childhood trauma, abuse and a lifetime of not being believed or listened to have left my mental health in a fragile state. Add being female and autistic to the mix and I'm a mess. Anxiety, seasonal affective disorder, though a darker summer is enough to kick it off, panic attacks, well, yeah. Working in the garden has been one of the best things, if not the best thing, I've done for my mental health. Most of the work I did required my physical attention, leaving my mind occupied enough to focus, but also free enough to think. I had a reason to go outside, to spend time outside, and to move around. I am admittedly a bit scared of winter, not just because it gets dark, but also because I'll be able to go outside less, to see the sun less. But I hope that the winter is as dry as the predictions. So far it is a wet mess. After the snowstorms, we are now stuck in a perpetual fog soup. The only thing that changes is the brightness. I wouldn't mind as much if I didn't have to go to school. Ha, look at that segue to the next question. I'm currently pursuing a master's degree in landscape ecology and nature conservation at the University of Greifswald in Germany. I live about 35 to 45 minutes away from there by car and currently car is the only way to get there because we live in a place without regular public transport. Well, technically there's a bus stop right outside the building, but it only really serves as a school bus. I'm in the first semester, so I still have about two years ahead of me. That means I will be here in this area for at least two more years. That scares me a little bit, but I also have a feeling that it'll get better next semester, because next semester the basic classes are done and it will be all electives, and also it will be summer. I did my bachelor's in marine ecology and fishery sciences at the University of Hamburg, also in Germany, and wrote a very elaborate thesis on marine protected areas. I hope that the masters can add a little bit of land-based conservation and general nature conversation to that mix. I've also studied for about a year in the Netherlands before the pandemic hit and finished an associate degree in California. I tried to get a marine biology bachelor back then, but we were forced to leave before I got further than the associates. Speaking of California, some of you wanted to know more about my accent, where I've lived and my story a little more in general. Let's start with the accent. I grew up in Germany, but my dad's an English teacher and started teaching me English very early on. And then during my teenage years, I got obsessed with going on an exchange to the US. I applied for a very competitive government scholarship and then spent a month preparing for it. I only got second place and never got to go, but the dream didn't die. It wasn't until I was 24 that my husband and I decided to actually give this dream a try. We applied for a business visa with my wedding photography and by a miracle we got it. We got four years in California and our four years in California were great. We both loved it, we had a great circle of friends, my husband had a really nice job and I really enjoyed studying there. But then when we were in the middle of applying for a more permanent green card situation, 
Trump changed the rules, and it was just too late to get the extra requirements fulfilled, so we had to leave. And I grieved. We'd been to New Zealand on vacation, and the immigration laws there are, well, promising, so we hired another lawyer and got a visa for New Zealand, but just for one year. But we had to leave the US, so we didn't have a lot of choices if we didn't want to give up and go back to Europe. So off to New Zealand we went. I spent the six months before we moved to New Zealand planning the move, and it was a lot of planning, but also hiking and diving as much as we could before we had to leave the area. New Zealand is a beautiful country. Seriously, it's so stunning. And if I hadn't been grieving LA so much, I might have enjoyed it a lot more. I might also have pushed more when the done deal visa turned out not to be such a done deal at all. But it wasn't LA and neither of us really, really felt at home, so we decided not to fight. And the only place we could go with eight weeks left in our visa was Europe. So we spent little time on choosing the next place, knowing that we only had eight weeks for what had taken me six months the time before. So we picked the place a little too quickly and ended up in The Hague in the Netherlands. Neither of us liked it there well at all. Really, it just wasn't for us. And then the pandemic hit and we realized we weren't surrounded by people we were on the same page with. Also, during the pandemic, it just seemed safest to go home or have the maximum level of health insurance and protection. So we moved back to Germany. It really did feel like giving up. We moved to a smaller town near Hamburg, where I studied and my husband worked, though neither of us actually had to go in person a lot because this was during the worst of the lockdown. And that's when we actually started to look for another place to live. We were paying city prices for an apartment that combined the worst of city life with the worst of rural life. And we were sick of it and also sick of being close to our limits. So we actually put into a search engine where the cheapest rents are in Germany. And that's how we ended up in Mecklenburg Vorpommern, or as it apparently is called in English, Mecklenburg Western Pomerania. Well, it's near the island of Rügen in northeast Germany. I drove east to check out the area around Stralsund and Greifswald, and a few weeks later we'd picked an apartment actually sight unseen. We'd done an online viewing because, well, it was the worst of COVID, but I didn't see the apartment until the day I drove here to sign the contract. This place can only be described as a tiny little apartment in the middle of nowhere. It's small, management doesn't really care, and there aren't many people around. Since the most recent energy crisis, utilities have gone up enough that we now pay about as much in utility as we do in rent. And while it's no longer as cheap here, it still is a lot cheaper than our place near the city. And prices there would likely have broken the budget. So now we live in a little apartment in the middle of nowhere. Last year, I tried to build a balcony garden here, and that somehow snowballed into renting first one, then a second garden. I am surrounded by a beautiful, partially protected forest. Except for the constant flux of neighbors hopefully moving in or moving out in defeat, and the weekly lawn mowing, it is quiet here. It's not perfect, but it is exactly what we need at the moment. No more, no less. We hope to save up enough to move on once I get my master's degree. With only one real income and quite a few medical expenses on my end, there is never as much money to save as I'd like. There are two choices for what comes next that largely depend on finances. In a perfect world, we'd buy a boat, restore it, and sail the world until we find a place we like enough to stay there permanently. Build a homestead, so sailing for a homeland, so to say. But boats are expensive, and with the way the world is going, we might need to skip that step in the end. I hope not, but we might end up going south somewhere in southern Europe where we don't need visas and buy land there and go straight to homesteading. But somehow that step is even scarier than buying a boat. It feels more permanent, especially without having seen all the places I would like to see. But for the next few years, there is a garden to restore in the meantime, and I'm excited for it all. But I'll tell you all about the garden and my plans for it 
in the next one of this series Q&A thing here. In the meantime, let me know if you have more questions. So long and thanks for being here.